Let us pray. Father, we thank you very much today for bringing us to another study in Revelation chapter 1 so we can see the vision and the picture of the glorified Christ. Lord, we are praying that as we come to the pages of scriptures today, the kind of honor, the kind of happiness and joy, the kind of excitement, the kind of submission that John had when he was in the Isle of the Patmos and he saw the vision of the glorified Christ. That kind of state of mind and spiritual understanding and reverence you give to every one of us in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that as the word comes out, we will not hear the word like sinners, because we are not sinners. We will not hear the word like strangers, because we are not strangers. We will not hear the word like newcomers and new converts, because we are, new, we are not newcomers, not new converts. We will not hear the word like children, babes in Christ, because we are not babes. We will not hear the word like seek, lukewarm Christians that are not interested in the word because that's not who we are. We will not hear the word like ordinary members of the church because we are more than that. We will hear the word like leaders understanding that if we're going to be developed and matured and restored, we need to know more about Jesus Christ. And as we come today, we come with reverence, and we come with respect, and we come wanting to listen as servants of the Lord. Say, speak, Lord, for your servants are hearing. And Lord, we pray you speak your word to us without withdrawing anything. And you help me, Lord, to declare your truth as it ought to be declared, so that your people, as they hear, they will learn. As they learn, they will grow. As they grow, they will minister more effectively. Help us to see you more. Help us, Lord, that we don't see anybody. That we don't allow anyone to usurp the place of Christ. That we don't allow anyone to block our view from Christ. That we don't allow anyone any personality to take the place of Christ, to take our heart from you, to take our reverence and respect from you, and to take our fear from you and substitute you for the human cell. Help us, Lord, we we'll look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Help us, Lord, to see you exalted and glorified. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said again, yeah. Amen. We praise the name of the Lord for bringing us to another study in the book of Revelation, we're in chapter 1. Yesterday we look at chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. And today we're looking at chapter 1, verses 4, 5, and 6. Open your Bible as we read together. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be to you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and a first begotten of the dead, and a prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And with John will say, Amen. We're looking at Christ's grace, glory, and dominion. You see, in the introduction to what we're looking at today, John says to the seven churches which are in Asia. Why did he write to those churches which are in Asia? Because that's what the Lord told him to do in verse 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, 
the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Tyra, and it says, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. The question then is, is this limited to only these seven churches? Is this only supposed to be read? Only supposed to be heard by the seven churches? No, because it says, Blessed is he that treateth anyone, and they that hear anyone. All the people that hear the words of the, of the words, the words of this prophecy. Not only that, every time he spoke to those churches, he ended by saying, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And then at the end, chapter 22, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Which means then, it's not limiting the writing, the revelation of the prophecy to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Then the question is, why are seven churches specifically named and chosen? To be the first recipients of this revelation. You need to understand the book of Revelation is full of sevens. As you go through the book of Revelation, you find seven churches. You find seven spirits. You find seven candlesticks. You find seven stars. You find seven lambs. Also seven seals. Also seven horns and seven bears or seven bulls and seven mountains and seven kings seven 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 going through the book of revelation not only that you also find seven beatitudes seven blessedness you also find seven years of judgment and you also find seven i am's of christ i am i am i am seven times and you find seven doxologies precise unto god in heaven why is the number seven so prominent then in this prophecy in the revelation because seven is a number that represents fullness completeness perfection and then that means then if seven is representing fullness completeness perfection when he writes to the seven churches he's writing to the whole church because it's the fullness the seven churches therefore were chosen to represent all the churches the message in the revelation is for the whole church that's the reason why we're looking at it because uh, the message is made for us we're going to divide the message to three parts number one grace and peace from the triune god the triune god that word triune the three in one the father the son the holy spirit and we can say grace and peace from the Trinitarian God. The three in one. Three united in one. Three personalities divine and yet one God. Grace and peace from the triune God. Point number two. Gratitude and praise to the redeeming God. When you are redeemed, when you are saved, when you are washed in the blood of the Lamb, when there is a change in your life made by the atonement of Christ, knowing that that salvation was planned by God the Father, effected by God the Son, manifested by the Holy Spirit unto you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And knowing that that salvation is by the oppression of the Spirit of God, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot see, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's why you need to have gratitude. And praise to the redeeming God because he is redeemer and because he has redeemed you you want to offer praise unto the Lord 
point number three, glory and power ascribed to the Son of God. Glory and power ascribed to the Son of God. Let's come back to point number one. Point number one, grace and peace from the triune God. Come on again in chapter one of Revelation. Revelation chapter one, verse four. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace unto you and peace. That's where we get the subtitle, grace and peace. Grace unto you and peace. Then it says, listen now, number one, from him which is, which was, and which is to come. That's one. And also from the seven spirits. Now you understand that? Seven. The fullness of the spirit. And it's depicting the plenitude of the fullness and the perfection of the Holy Ghost. And it's the Holy Ghost mentioned there, greetings, grace, and peace from the seven spirits which are before the throne. Then number three now, and from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. And we need to find out because we are saying this grace, this peace, is coming from the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, from the triune God. This expression, look at it again. Verse 4, grace unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. And you say, is that not Jesus Christ? No. Because it says in verse 5, And now from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, so that makes a distinction, that makes a difference between the first personality and this Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. Apart from that, look at chapter 4 of Revelation. Revelation chapter 4. Verse 8, and the four beasts, the four living creatures, and each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, inside, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, that's the Father, which was and is and is to come. So then you will see that the expression which was, which uh, is, and which is to come, it was used for the Father, God the Father. In Revelation chapter 11, Revelation chapter 11, reading verse 17, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come. You see then the expression, he was, he is, and he is to come, used here about, G, about the Father, God the Father. Revelation chapter 16. Revelation 16, I'm reading to you from verse 5. Revelation 16, 5. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be because thou hast judged thus the judge of all the flesh the god of heaven that's the heavenly father referred to as he was and he is and he is to come so then we know that this uh, grace and peace that we're reading about from chapter one of Revelation verse 4 is coming from the Father. Come back. Revelation chapter 1 verse 4. John to the seven churches, all the churches now, seven representing everything, which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come from the Father. Now, 
grace and peace from the Holy Spirit too. Because it says in verse 4, And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And I told you that refers to the Holy Ghost. In Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah 11, reading there in verse 2, Isaiah chapter 11, I'm reading to you from verse 2. Looking at the attributes and the characteristics of the Spirit of the living God and the Spirit of the Lord, one, shall rest on you. The Spirit of wisdom, two, and of understanding, three, and the spirit of counsel, four, and the spirit of might, five, and the spirit of knowledge, seven, six, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord, seven. The seven spirits is referred to as seven because it has the, the fullness, the perfection, the completeness. That's why it says, and from the seven spirits, actually from the spirit of God, characterized in all these seven ways, the perfection of the very power of God and the completeness of the very power of God and the fullness of the very power of God. And that's why it says, from the seven spirits in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. Reading from verse 6, Revelation 5, 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, the living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as each had been slain, having seven hearts, that's power, and seven eyes, that's knowledge, which are the seven spirits of God, God sent forth unto all the earth. When it says seven hands, that means the totality of power, the completeness of power, the perfection of power. And then when it says seven eyes, is the perfection of knowledge, is the fullness of knowledge. And now the seven spirits is the plenitude of the fullness of the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost. And so as we come back to chapter 1, verse 4, chapter 1, verse 4, John. To the seven churches in Asia, grace unto you, and peace from God the Father, him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the Holy Ghost, that is, from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Then come to verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, this is the very Son of God. This is our Savior and Redeemer. This is our Lord. This is the one that loved us so much and he came to die for us to take our sins away. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Uh, you, you look at Jesus Christ. Uh, you see the way Jesus Christ is described there in Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 4 Behold I have given him for a witness Isn't that what we read in Revelation? I've given him for a witness to the people and a leader and a commander of to the people That's why it says Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness then the first begotten First begotten of the dead. How do you understand that? Didn't Elijah raise someone from the dead before Jesus ever came to the earth? Didn't Elisha raise someone from the dead before Jesus ever came to the earth? Jesus, didn't Jesus Christ himself raise some from the dead before he even died? And why then is he referred to you as the first begotten from the dead? That word first begotten in the Greek, it means the chief. It means the first. It means the preeminent. That is, it's kind of resurrection. Preeminent, first, no equal, incomparable. 
when Elijah raised that fellow from the dead, eventually that fellow died when his time came because it's appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment and when elisha raised that other fellow from the dead that fellow died again later at his own time and when jesus christ raised up the daughter of jairus from the dead eventually when the time came she died and that woman the widow of nain when jesus raised the son from the dead when the time came that fellow still died but jesus christ after he was raised from the dead incomparable resurrection incomparable that you cannot compare with any other resurrection the first the preeminent, the unequaled, unparalleled resurrection. After that resurrection, he ascended into heaven. That's why it says this Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten, and the preeminent, and the incomparable one to all the other people that were raised from the dead, the first begotten of the dead. And then it says, the prince of the kings of the earth that's the title given to the lord jesus christ the prince of the kings of the earth it was it was a great drama come and look at it in john chapter 18 john chapter 18 and and here was you know this fellow questioning jesus christ and in verse 37 and pilate therefore said unto him art thou a king then what a question pilate asked tell me what are you saying about yourself are you a king then ah jesus answered thou sayest i am a king to this end for this reason for this purpose to this end was I born. For this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And do you see that? That the Lord Jesus Christ referred to as the one that is the king of the prince of the earth in psalm 89 psalm 89 reading there in verse 27 89 27 here the lord was uh, almighty god was talking to david and then he went beyond david and he was eventually talking about christ in psalm 89 verse 37 here it says, it shall be established forever as the moon and as the faithful witness in heaven. Referring to the kingdom, the kingdom to come. The kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Let me have a good amen. Uh, please, please. We prayed at the beginning. That what we're studying about Christ, we're not going to be listening as if we were sinners, strangers to Christ. We're not, we're not listening as if we are newcomers and new converts. We're not listening as if we are babes in Christ. We're not listening as if we are just ordinary members of the family of God. We're not listening as if we are just people that, you know, we're lethargic and cold and, and lukewarm. We're talking about Christ, the lover of your soul. We're talking about Christ, the great shepherd and the chief shepherd. We're, we're talking about Christ, the author and the finisher of your faith. We're talking about Christ, this bread of life, and without him you cannot live. We're talking about Christ, this kind of our salvation we're talking about christ this deliverer of your soul we're talking about emmanuel we're talking about the friend of sinners we're talking about this 
God, God in the form of flesh, the incarnate God. We're talking about the healer of all your sicknesses, about your intercessor in heaven. We're talking about the one that came to justify us, about the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we're talking about the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. I'm talking to you about the Messiah, this mediator between God and man, the one that has a name above every name. We're talking about the one that said, because he overcame, you too will overcome. We're talking about the Prince of Peace. We're talking about the righteous one, the Redeemer. We're talking about the Savior, the Sanctifier. And we're talking about the Teacher of the Eternal Truth. We're talking about the unique Son of the Living God. We're talking about the wonder of heaven that came to give us the water of life. And we're talking about the Alpha and the Omega. We're talking about the beginning and the ending. We're talking about the one that comes to change your life. And when we talk about him, you need to get excited. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the one that is a faithful witness, and Jesus Christ, the one that tells us the very first begotten from the dead, Jesus Christ, this Jesus Christ, the King of the Prince of the earth. And that's the reason why we're excited and as leaders as we come to see the vision of the glorified Christ. Uh, you know, he imparts his life. He imparts everything to you so that you can go to the world and declare who Jesus is. And when sinners hear you and when believers hear you, something will happen in their lives when you talk about him. Hear what I've read to you here about the Trinitarian benediction, grace and peace coming from the triune God, from God the Father, from God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It is the desire of the Father. It is the desire of the Son. It is the desire of the Holy Spirit that you will have the grace of God, grace unto you, and peace. When it says grace, what grace? Number one, saving grace. A grace that saves. Number two, sustaining grace. The grace that sustains you. Number three, sanctifying grace. The grace that sanctifies and purifies you. Number four, sufficient grace. When it says grace unto you. Grace for every occasion. And grace for every situation. You need salvation. Grace available. And you need to be sustained in the kingdom of God. Grace is available. You need to be sanctified. Grace is available. You need, you need something that is sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you. We have this grace that is sufficient. And then it says peace. Peace with God. And the peace of God. Peace in our heart. And peace that passes understanding. And peace within us. And peace among ourselves. The eternal God, I've already told you, is referred to as he which is and which was and which is to come. From the eternal past to the eternal future. He is ever the same. He is the everlasting father who is the same in the absoluteness of his unchanging nature. And eternal existence. And then it says, this grace and this peace is also coming from the Holy Spirit. And it's described as the seven spirits of God. I told you the number seven is symbolic and just signifies fullness, perfection, completeness. And it is used to describe him because of the plenitude of the fullness and perfection of his nature. The Holy Spirit then in glory, fullness and perfection, desires and he bestows grace and peace upon the church. And Jesus Christ, did you see those three titles? Number one, faithful witness. Number two, false begotten of the dead. Number three, the prince of the kings of the earth. And as a faithful witness, he testifies to the eternal truth of God. And he himself, he was truth personified. He died bearing witness to the truth. And he rose from the dead, the first begotten, the preeminent of all that had ever been raised from the dead. This Christ, the prince, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Have you followed the Bible and see the way the Bible, the New Testament, reveals the kingship of Jesus Christ? One, the king of the Jews. Matthew chapter 2 verse 2. Two, the king of Israel. John 1 verse 49. Three, the king of glory. 
Psalm 24 verse 7. For it says, the king of the saints. Revelation 15 verse 3 and 5. The king of kings. Revelation chapter 19 verse 16. The king of the Jews. The king of Israel. The king of glory. The king of the saints. The king of kings. By virtue of his atoning work, in the power of his resurrection from the dead, and in the royal authority of his eternal kingship, this Jesus Christ pronounces grace upon you. And he pronounces peace upon you. The grace of God will never leave your life. And the peace of God will never leave your heart. Will never leave your home. You'll be going from peace unto peace until your peace will be as a river. Very deep and very wide. May God give all of you the peace that passes understanding. Point number two. Gratitude and praise to the redeeming God. Gratitude and praise to the redeeming God. We come to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, I'm reading the latter part of verse 5, and then the first part of verse 6. Verse 5, and from uh, verse 5, the latter part, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father gratitude and praise to the redeeming God you see when you are born again and you recollect who you were and you see the love of God for you you'll be so grateful and you'll be praising the Lord these verses contain the reasons for our praise and gratitude to God and to Christ our Savior and Redeemer Three things come to focus. Number one, he loved us. Look at it in that verse 5. Unto him that loved us. That's the first reason for praising the Lord, for giving gratitude unto the Lord. Number two, he washed us from our sins in his own blood. Look at that in that verse 5. And washed us from our sins in his own blood the third reason why we're giving praise gratitude to the redeeming god is found in the first part of verse 6 and he has made us kings and priests unto god and his father and then he tells you to him be glory and dominion forever and ever uh, you see these three reasons why we had to praise the Lord. And this is the reason why saints of old, believers of all time, every time they remembered what they were before and what they have become now and what the Lord has done for them. And that, that's the reason they praise the Lord every time. In First Timothy chapter 1, First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And Paul the Apostle, Saul of Tarsus, he never forgot the, the, the graciousness of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, the compassion of God. And every time he came to talking about his salvation, his redemption, it was like almost in a dream, almost like I'm still amazed, I'm dazed, I just don't understand how God could love a person like me. And he said in verse 13, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy. He said, church, can you think about it? Timothy, can you think about it? He said, Timothy, you won't understand. I know you are saved and I am saved. And I know you are born again, and I am born again. I know you are redeemed, and I am redeemed. But I thank God for your salvation. But my own salvation, I'm surprised. I'm amazed. I don't know what to think about it. 
It's like I'm still in a dream. Can there be a God that will love a person like me? See what I did? I contradicted him. I blasphemed his name. Even the people that served and worshipped him, I went after them. I imprisoned them. I compelled them to blaspheme. And when I was going to Damascus, I was not going to a crusade. I was not going to a church service. I was not going to seek the face of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. I was not asking for mercy. I was fuming with anger in my heart. And I was really aggressive, wanting those people. I had letters of recommendation, of authority in my hand. Anybody I see following the way, the truth, and the life, following Jesus Christ of this way, I will imprison them. Can you think about it? The grace of God. Can you think about it? The mercy of God. He met me on the way and he called my name. And my mother called my name before. My father called my name before. Members of the Sanhedrin called my name before. I never had my name like that before. The way he pronounced it, I stopped. And the light shone. And I fell to the ground. I knew, I knew, I knew. Somebody calling my name like that from up there is not a man. And I said, who are you, Lord? I, I knew it had to be the Lord. But I didn't know it was Jesus. And then he said, I am Jesus. It didn't take me a minute. I broke down. I surrendered. I got saved. I knew he was searching for me. I knew he was looking for me. I knew that his love, his compassion, his mercy will not leave me. Who was a blasphemer and a persecutor? and injurious but i obtained mercy he obtained the mercy of god you know if god can give mercy to saul of tarsus no matter who you are he will give mercy to you he'll give mercy to your wife he'll give mercy to your husband he'll give mercy to your children and all those people all those people in your church that you are writing of this one will never get saved stop saying that don't say that again if god can give mercy unto Saul of Tarsus, anybody that comes across, comes over the door of your church building, God will show mercy unto them. In verse 14, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. You know, the man was just grateful. Gratitude and praise to the redeeming God. In, in, it tells us the reason why. He said, because he loved us, then too he washed us, and then he's made us kings and priests. And let's see them as other parts of scripture reveal these things to us, what the Lord has done for us. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Reading there in verse 2, it says, And walk in love, as Christ also has loved us. Christ has loved us, and has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet-smelling savor. He loved us. In First John chapter 3, Verse 16, First John, talking about the love of God for us. The love of God for us. Oh, I, I hope there's nobody saying, we know that already. When, when you're at home, and you've been married now for 10 years, for 30 years, and you know, your wife just woke up in the morning, after 30 years of marriage, and he says, honey, I love you. Do you say, is that what you wanted to say? Didn't I know that? You don't have any other thing to say. 30 years of marriage, you are just telling me, I love you. Do you say that? Oh, you become happy. You say this woman, and you know the woman says, I, I'm just, every time, you know, 30 years have gone and I'm still grateful that, you know, God led me to marry and I want to tell you once again, anything I can do just to say, I love you. You are happy. So why are you telling me then that, you know, he's telling us Jesus loves me. Didn't I know that I'm born again? I know John 3, 16. When I tell you once again, after 30 years of being born again, I come to tell you this morning, Jesus 
loves you. Yeah. Are you happy? Yeah. In First John chapter 3, First John chapter 3, I'm reading verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Hereby perceive we the love of God. He laid his life down for us. Number two, he washed us from our sins. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he washed us, washed us, washed us from our sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 11, it tells us what the Lord has done for us. And such was some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He washed us from our sins. First John, First John chapter 1, First John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, washes us, cleanses us from all sin. And that's the reason we, we love him and we're showing gratitude unto him. Number three, he's made us kings and priests unto our God. First Peter, first Peter, chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, priests and kings. Royal, that's kingship. Priesthood, that's relating to our being priests because of Christ. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that he should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, kings and priests. Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. Revelation 5, 10. And he has made us unto God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth I pray you'll be among them yeah. already you have seen that we're showing gratitude and praise to the Lord because he has redeemed us and he's, he loved us before even washing us did you realize that he loved us before washing us, before cleansing us. That means while we were yet dirty, unclean, defiled, before we were ever cleansed or washed, he loved us. He loves us now after we are washed. He loves us now after he has brought us unto himself. Before going to the cross, he loved us. While on the cross, he remembered us, he loved us because he was dying for our sins. And now, after he rose from the dead, he still loves us. And now, after he has gone to heaven, he still loves us and is making intercession for us. Glory be to the Lord. He's now seated on the throne of God above. And he has not forgotten us. Who are we? Don't you know? Don't you remember some of your you know, friends, bosom friends? When you were in the school together, when you had nothing, when they had nothing. Now that, you know, they are out of school and they are promoted and they are up there. And you want to see them in their office. Don't you know how difficult they have forgotten us now that they are up there. But Jesus Christ, before the cross, on the cross, after the cross, after he ascended to heaven. Now that he's on the right hand of majesty above, he still remembers us. He loves us. We must praise the name of God. The prince is somebody, the person who is, you know, the prince of the whole earth. The king of, of the kings of the earth. And you know, even when the earth is passed away, and when the present universe would have gone out of existence, it will still continue loving you. 
unto him but praise and glory. And then the Bible says he washed us, washed us. And if you are there this morning, I'm asking you, do you feel the cleansing of the blood of Jesus in your soul, in your spirit, in your mind? As you felt dirty before, and you're almost ashamed of yourself every day. But now you came to Jesus, the pool that flowed, the pool of the blood that flowed from Emmanuel's side. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in you. The water and the blood from your river side which flowed. Be of sin that double kill. Cleansing me from the guilt and from the very nature of sin. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? To Him that loved us, one, and two, that washed us from our sins. Another translation put it as loosed us from our sins. He released us from the power of sin. From the lodge of sin, from the burden of sin, from the binding chains of our sins. He loosed us, he washed us, he released us. Praise the Lord, we are free. Because if the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And then it says that he has now made us kings and priests unto the Lord. As kings, we have authority. You have authority. We shall reign in, in life on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. As representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall reign so that we keep on carrying out his will on earth. And we shall sit on the throne with Jesus Christ one day. You'll be there to judge the angels and to judge the world. As priests, we have access to God for ourselves as priests. And then we have access to God on behalf of other people. We can pray for ourselves. We can pray for other people. Three things he did for us. Number one, he, lo he, he loved us. Number two, he loosed us. Number three, he lifted us. He loved us before we ever knew him. Number two, he loosed us, released us, washed us, loosed us from the binding chains of our sins. Number three, he lifted us from the position of degradation where we were and to now the high level of kings and priests unto the Lord our God. Point number three, glory and power ascribed to the Son of God. Glory and power ascribed to the Son of God. In Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, and he has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Glory and power ascribed to the Son of God in chapter 5 of Revelation. Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing ascribing glory as well as power to the very Son of God. And in Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Hebrews 13, verse 20. Now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom the what? Glory 
forever and ever and everybody said amen in second timothy second timothy chapter four second timothy chapter four verse 18 second timothy 4 18 and the lord shall deliver me from every evil work the lord will deliver you from every evil work and will preserve me will preserve you unto his everlasting heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever uh, you know these uh, people they were not ungrateful people that just received and they never praise the Lord. They never ascribe glory and honor unto the Lord. How could church, how could people of God, how could children of God be so ungrateful? And they, you know, receive something from the Lord. They may just say, thank you, Jesus. They go. The next time they come, they will not even spend five minutes. They will not spend 30 minutes just praising God, just praising God. You know, it's like your child. You understand, the level of maturity of your child, when, you know, every time he comes, Dad, give me this. You give him, thank you, Father. And then when he comes again, Dad, give me this. You give him, thank you, Father. And then, Mom, Dad has given me a son. How about your own? Christmas present, New Year present. How about, and once your dad gave you, we gave you, no, Mom, give me your own. And then Mom will find something and give. Thank you, Mom. And we'll come back again. Is that all? Any other thing? Oh, but when you see one of the children, one of the children, you know, you, you are just doing something. And you're sitting down. And a child comes and sits by your side. You want something? No, mom. I just want to tell you how much I love you. How much I appreciate you. I just want to tell you that I remember you every time. Mom, you know, when I get to school, anywhere I go, I just remember your face. Mom, can you give me your picture so I keep your picture with me so that anytime you're away, because I'm always, I just love you as my mother. That child does not need to ask you anything. You look for something that will be a blessing to that child and just keep on giving. He doesn't need to be asking and demanding. And we children, why don't we do that unto God and just come before him for all he has done for us, for saving us, for sanctifying us, for filling us with the Holy Ghost, and for healing us, and for delivering us, for giving us good wives, for giving us good husbands, for giving us good children, for protecting us, for preserving our lives, for making us significant to the kingdom of God, for lifting us up and making us kings and priests unto the Father, unto the God of heaven. Why don't we just come praising the Lord, ascribing glory and power unto the very Son of God who has done everything for us. Why is it that when we come before the Lord, we have difficulty thanking God, praising God, glorifying God for even five minutes? And we're so much in a hurry, and maybe because of other things, why don't we just forget ourselves in the praise and the glory, in the honor of the Lord, and see what the Lord means to us, and just keep on glorifying find him and praising the name of the Lord. Paul the apostle, he was always praising the Lord. Always praising the Lord. He has delivered me and he will keep on delivering me and he will preserve me to his everlasting kingdom. And then even before I get into that kingdom, glory, honor, be unto his holy name. That's the way it ought to be in First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. I'm reading to you there from verse 11. First Peter 4, 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. That God in all things may be glorified. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, whom to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. In chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 11. 1 Peter 5, 11. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. 
Amen. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But growing grace, growing grace, saving grace, grow. Sustaining grace, don't stop there, grow. Sanctifying grace, don't stop there, grow. Sufficient grace is also available, but growing grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Jude, in Jude verse 25. Jude, verse 25, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Yeah. Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, has the right to everlasting praise. He's exalted. And honored by the Father. And if the heavenly Father has honored him, and the angels are worshiping him, and the redeemed in heaven are worshiping him, we who are here on the earth, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, we need to also worship and adore him. As you look at this doxology, this praise, in the, you'll find that there are seven doxologies in the book of Revelation. And, and it's remarkable how these doxologies, praises, how they grow as we move on in the book of Revelation. Here, in this place I read to you, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, you have only two elements, two notes of praise. To him, the glory and dominion. By the time you come to chapter 4, verses 9 to 11, there are not two again, not two notes, but three notes. Three notes of praise. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. By the time you come to chapter 5, it's growing. The doxology now has four notes. Blessing, honor, glory, and power. Later, as we move on, it grows and grows. It now becomes blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might. Be unto God, unto our God forever and ever. As we grow in love, as we grow in spiritual understanding, as we grow in consecration to God, so should our praise, our adoration unto God grow. And then we'll be giving glory to God with our lives, with our lives, and as we move on every day, we keep on glorifying the Lord. I am praying that the Lord will be glorified in your life, glorified in your heart, glorified in your home, glorified through all through your actions, both now and forevermore. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be to you. And peace from him, which is, and which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits, which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he has made us kings and priests. Unto God and his Father. And now we're going to join John. Everybody now to him be glory and dominion. And forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Everybody said, Amen. Rise up and glorify the Lord. Praise the Lord for all the Lord has done for you. Praise the Lord. He has saved you. Praise the Lord. He has given you grace. Praise the Lord. He has filled you with peace. Praise the Lord. He has made you kings and priests unto God the Father. Praise the Lord for what the Lord has done for you.